Amen. Good morning to all of you and just to be able to say one more time, thanks to the blood of Jesus Christ, sin is gone and we have new names, new hearts and new minds and we expect him to come for us soon, don't we? Praise God forever. Welcome, and I say welcome to Lake Park, way out in Indian Trail. They're worshiping with us. And on this Memorial Day, I certainly want to take a moment and give honor to those who have over the years spilled blood so that not only we could remain free, but that other countries could be free. There is American blood in the soil all over Europe, the South Pacific, and anywhere you want to go. And I know these days, too many, America is a villain. But not to me. I'm thankful that God allowed me to be born here. And we have so many people in this church from other countries. You'll just have to excuse us because we remember those who paid tremendous prices in this country. We remember them. And we ask God to bless their families and we want God to bless this country. I love this country. I am the son of a decorated veteran and I've heard the stories of how men and women suffered in foreign countries just so those countries would not be overridden by wickedness God raised this country up and I'm proud to be an American and I mean what I'm saying I'm proud to be an American We're just that way in this country. We're patriotic. We believe that what we do is good. Everything is not right. But our purpose over the years has been to liberate people. And no other country in the history of the world has fed more people, clothed more people, preached the gospel to more people, and no other country has taken the step to protect the nation of Israel as the United States of America has. And that is one of the reasons that God has been good to us. So I want us to sing a prayer. I learned it as a tiny, tiny fellow. God bless America. God bless America. May we once again remember why you raised us up. May we return to the faith of our fathers. May we remember that without God we are absolutely nothing and are headed toward destruction. But if we turn to you and once again recognize that you're our source and our creator, if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, you'll hear us. You'll return to us. You'll heal our land. You'll forgive our sins. Thank you for that promise. And may we do it. Amen. Amen. You know, I'd probably stay out of trouble if I would just keep my mouth shut about some things. And I had every intention of 
being a nice guy when I walked to the pulpit this morning. I really did. <laughs> but I tell you, about uh, six weeks ago, maybe five, some Navy SEALs took care of business. And uh, I was... I, wait a minute, wait, there's no... And see, that's the way I feel about it. You don't negotiate with terrorists. You don't sit down at the table with people who have already decided you don't need to exist. They won't change their mind. So you don't negotiate. You don't negotiate with the devil. You don't negotiate with sin. You have to be exact. You have to kill the flesh. You have to fight this spiritual warfare the same way you have to fight militarily. You can't be a nice guy. You have to understand that your enemy, the devil, has already declared that you are going to be destroyed. So you can't play around with a rattlesnake. So I was very happy a few weeks ago. I don't know why. It's just that I see so much, uh, uh, how do you say, so many apologies these days for the things we've had to do to keep this nation safe. And so when those pirates went to meet their creator at the hands of some very, very good shooters, I said, thank God. That's all I said. And for all of the pacifists in here and all the liberals... I'll have you turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. No need to write me, no need to email me, no need to talk to me about thou shalt not kill and all that stuff. Because you're talking to a guy that carries. <laughs> See, now what am I going to preach? <laughs> Love thy neighbor as thyself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Read them with me, please. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Somebody ought to be happy about that. Now may the true and living God who has delivered us be glorified by His own Word this morning. Teach us, touch us, and cause us to walk in the truth, O Lord Jesus. Amen. And all God's people said amen. amen. Thank you for being seated. Thessalonica was one of those cities that was uh, inundated with and soaked in idolatry. There were idols on every corner, gods of every making. Every person had his or her own deity to worship, as was the case in most of those cities, uh, such as Ephesus, Corinth. So the whole... Uh, world at that time, all of that area where Paul evangelized was eaten up with idolatry. And in this letter, he is writing to them to say, everywhere I go, I hear about your faith. The talk around this part of the world is that you people who were so eaten up with idolatry have turned from idols. You dropped them. You have forsaken that worship and you've turned to the true God and now you are serving Him. The talk is that you have changed so drastically that people know something miraculous has happened to you people. You who were obsessed 
with gods, all kinds of gods, not just Greek and Roman gods, but gods you made in your own mind, suddenly you are thinking about only one God and you declare that He's the true and living God and your life is now exhibiting your faith because you are serving the true and living God. And not only that, you are waiting for His Son from heaven. This God you say is alive and has changed you is actually coming to get you, they say. You have declared to them, we are going to work for Him and proclaim Him till He comes to get us. And Paul says, you're making a real impact. People are stirred up about this. And really, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we've done. We as believers have turned from idolatry the foolishness and emptiness of a world without Jesus, of a life without Jesus. All the things people do who don't need Jesus is idolatrous. It's serving dead things. It's living for dead things. But when one comes to faith in Christ, he suddenly turns from all of that he realizes how utterly absurd it is to live for things that cannot satisfy. They recognize that there is a condition they find themselves in called sin. And only a Savior can deliver from sin. They have turned or we have turned to Jesus, confessed that we are sinners... Asked Him as a Savior to forgive us. And now as born again people who know the true and living God. As we work for Him day after day. The one thing in the back of every believer's mind is this. He's coming for me. He could come today. This could be the day that I see Jesus for myself. Let me just give you a very brief synopsis of what's happening biblically in the world. Now, I'm talking biblically. Chronologically, from Scripture, the next thing that's going to happen is the rapture of the church. It's when... Now, this is all Bible. You see, I've realized, pastoring a big old church like this, that you have a lot of people who've gone to church, but they don't know much about the Bible. They've gone to churches where the Bible was not taught. It was uh, philosophy and, uh, and uh, socialism to a degree, you know. Let's all get along and work together and build houses for people and feed them and all, all of that. But there's been no biblical explanation of who God is and what He expects from us. So from the Scriptures, I tell you that the next event that will happen in this world is that one of these days, and it could be today, because nobody knows when it's going to happen, suddenly believers like you and me, people who are looking for Him, are going to be gone. Now, I know you've heard it when you were little and you thought maybe that was some kind of uh, old-fashioned Pentecostal fairy tale, but that's not a fairy tale. That's what the Scriptures teach profoundly, that the Lord is coming back in the clouds and... Those that are looking for Him will be caught up. He'll take them home to heaven. Only those who are unsaved will be left for a time of judgment and punishment. Seven years of horrible things happening on this earth as time wears down and the world as we know it comes to an end. There's going to be a terrible one world government. And see, hear me when I tell you. I don't know if it will be President Obama but one or, or another of an American president is going to forsake Israel. It's going to happen. I want to be very clear. This president has expressed publicly his support for Israel. But you see there is this underlying gnawing pressure from people in this country and around the world 
to forsake Israel because they are in a land they ought not to be. And they are persecuting people they ought not to persecute. The Bible teaches that at some point every nation is going to turn against the land of Israel and the people of God. That's going to happen. And when all of that takes place, and it looks like the nation of Israel is going to be erased from the earth, suddenly, the Bible says, the clouds are going to split again. And like a bolt of lightning from the east to the west, Jesus Christ is going to appear and we will be with him, we who were caught up earlier, and he's coming back to this earth and he's going to set up his headquarters in Jerusalem and he's going to judge the unrighteous and the righteous who were on the earth at that time. And set up a kingdom for a thousand years of perfect peace. Now ladies and gentlemen, that's what this is about. They've turned from idols to serve the living God. And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus who has delivered us from the wrath that is to come. We who are watching and waiting and believing and trusting and working and worshiping now are going to be delivered from the punishment that's coming on the earth at that time. So I've come with good news this morning. I've come to tell you that trouble is inevitable and destruction is on the way, but there is a way out. And that way out is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God who has delivered us from the wrath to come and is coming back for us soon and very soon. So what are we doing? We're waiting. I've been waiting ever since I realized I was a Christian. Just waiting. I've been listening to preachers all my life tell me he could come any moment. So I've been waiting. I have people say, but what makes you think he's coming? We've waited The apostles waited. It's been 2,000 years. I don't know. That Bible says he's coming. And he's coming for those waiting on him. So I'm just waiting. Everybody's waiting for something. What are you waiting for? We've all waited. We will wait till we die. I've waited in the doctor's office. Haven't you? Be here promptly at 830 they say, and at 1045, you are still waiting, right? You just wait. You figure it's important enough to wait, so you wait. You took the whole day off. Uh, You probably missed breakfast, might miss lunch, can't even afford to go to the restroom because they might call your name, and then they'll get on you because you went to the restroom when they told you to be there at 8.30. But we wait because in our minds we think, I know I'm going to get in before the offices close. (laughs) So I've got till at least or at most 5 o'clock. So we just wait, don't we? We wait at stoplights. The light turns red and we know we have a minute to a minute and a half. So, in anticipation that the light is going to change, we get some stuff done. We make a phone call. We stir our coffee. We unwrap our Bojangles biscuit. (laughs) We make a note. We turn around and slap one of the kids. (laughs) But we have this anticipation that in just a few more seconds, you're going to look to the left or to the right and barely see a caution on the other direction so you get it in gear to take off. You waited. We wait for babies. Now, you can say that's a long time, but it's not really long if you know when it's coming. You have time to prepare. So you buy a crib, you paint the room, you buy the right color clothes 
for the child. You wait and you wait. Some days are longer than others. And as you get towards the end, all the days are filled with tension and frustration. And you hear mothers say, I cannot take this another day. I will never do this again as long as I live. I am done with it. Have you ever, when I dedicate babies, you've seen all these mothers and daddies up here? Nod your head if so. And have you noticed that everyone I say to, I'll see you back in a few months, the mother says, no, you won't. (laughs) Will I see you back? (laughs) Not me. He may be with somebody else, but it won't be with me. (laughs) See? Waiting. We've spent our whole life waiting. But the Bible teaches we're not the only ones waiting. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8, if you would, please. And I want you to see some beautiful verses that look beyond the physical and the natural. And it tells us that it's not only the believers that are waiting for His Son from heaven. Watch this now. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits. Now, folks, stop a moment and look at me. In the next verses that I read, you will see these two words, eagerly waits, several times. You won't find just the word waits. Every time it's eagerly waits. For the earnest sincere, bottom-of-the-heart expectation of the creation. That is everything that we know about. Everything that God put into existence by the word of Jesus. Everything that is, is earnestly and eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. What does that mean? Everything God made is anxiously and eagerly awaiting the moment when the trumpet sounds and we who are saved and mortal are caught up and given new bodies like the body of Jesus and we are then manifested as the sons of God. Can you imagine the entire creation eagerly waiting for that moment? Keep going. For the creation was subjected to futility. That means everything God made was made in a fashion that it's going to die. There's a sense of meaninglessness to it. Not willingly. The creation didn't want that. Creation wants to thrive and flourish. But God did it because of him who subjected it in hope. He had a plan in mind. Still got it in mind, thank you very much. It's a plan of hope. Something to wait for. Something to look forward to. Something besides a sporting event. Something besides a raise. Something better than a new job. Something better than a new car. It's eternal life made like Jesus. And the whole creation has a heart that thumps. Now when you say the whole creation, you're not just talking about living things. He said the whole creation. That's rocks and water and trees and even atmosphere. Are you hearing what the Bible is saying? Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption or decay into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is why creation is eagerly awaiting the return of the Lord. What we see now around us is ugly. Even the most... If you walk out of this door, don't please, (laughs) into that little garden area, you will see beautiful flowers, vines, beautiful green grass, all that stuff. We can have weddings out there. 
You go to the prettiest flower shop anywhere. Go to the most beautiful mountain range anywhere. And it will take your breath. But the Bible teaches that it's ugly. It's ugly because it's under a curse. The real full beauty of it has never been seen. The full divine manifestation of it has not yet been given. There are teachings in the old Jewish Talmud that when Messiah comes and the kingdom appears and the curse is lifted, even the dirt will glow. The rocks will be like jewels everywhere. The mountains will be on fire. Everything you see will will have to be seen through glorified eyes because of the beauty of divinity in it. But right now, it's under a curse. We've gotten used to ugliness. We say, that's a pretty blouse. That's a pretty shirt. That's a pretty car. Those are pretty flowers. My dog is beautiful. My wife's pretty. (laughs) Or what, (laughs) you know. We have adjectives to describe things that appeal to these dying eyes. But the Bible teaches that on that day when the curse is lifted and there is no more decay and the glory of the Lord comes upon us and we are manifested as His sons, the curse is going to be lifted and the universe will become more brilliant and indescribably beautiful than anybody can possibly imagine. And the Bible says... The creation is eagerly waiting for it. Are there more scriptures there? For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. That's why volcanoes are restless. They want it to happen. That's why storms arise over the sea. Creation It's just frustrated with all of this. The earth moves. Earthquakes take place. There's violence and movement everywhere you turn because creation says, when, oh God, when will our Creator come and be one with us again? When will you lift this ugly veil? When will you take this corruption, this rottenness off of us so that we can truly be what you made us to be? And not only they... But we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That's one of the problems you feel right now. You think it's a problem at home. You think it's a problem at work. But all of those things are just indications of the true groaning and the reason that there is a desire and an uneasiness and a homesickness inside of every one of us. We're not home yet. We haven't seen Him yet. We've been saved in our souls, but we're ready for the decay to be removed from this body so we can put on an eternal, glorious body like that of Jesus. Part of the frustration. Now keep going with me here. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 through 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for Him. He will appear a second time apart from sin. That means this time He won't be dealing with sin. This time He's coming to receive His children. But did you notice eagerly await? Folks, that's the state of mind every believer must be living in. You can't just occasionally say, oh, Jesus is coming. It must be a turbo, energized, driving force and factor in your life. Everything you do must be done because he could come at any moment. Did you hear me? The conversation you have, your relationship with people, your business ethics, your worship, everything must be done. Because at any moment, Jesus Christ could become real in your face. You could see him before you could blink your eye. And that's what drove Paul. 
That was what was driving the Thessalonians. That's what should be driving every one of us today. Those who eagerly await. Now, if you find yourself eagerly waiting, you will also find yourself not marching with the crowd. Excuse me. You will find yourself becoming more and more odd and at odds. Things you're just not comfortable with anymore. Places you just don't care about going anymore. Things you just don't want to do anymore. Am I, te- am I telling the truth? I just have spasms like that every once in a while. Have you noticed? Have you noticed that the longer you live, the more you pray, the more deeply you study the Scriptures, the more unusual you feel. You don't fit in. You're uncomfortable. And that's what makes evangelism so hard at times. Because we're called to go into uncomfortable places. They don't talk the way we do. They don't act the way we do. We'd rather not be around that. It's, it's offensive to us. And yet we're the only avenue they will have to see the light. It's just that way. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to do is not lose the eagerness. And I want to be driven more by this waiting sensation that it could happen today. See, this is on your mind all the time. Am I... I got a... Seemingly across the front here, I'm getting some response, but is this on anybody else's mind all the time? Jesus could come today. When you read the scriptures that say, live so that you will not be ashamed when he returns. It makes you think, if he comes back right now, do I want to be doing this? Do I want to be talking this way? If he comes back right now, will I be ashamed or will I be able to say, come Lord? And will he say, glad to see you son. That's what we're after. It's on your mind all the time. Never in the day am I not to some degree aware of how quickly I could be gone from this world. And that's what makes you live right. It's on your mind. Now, I know what the world says. They say, that's the problem with you people. Uh, you, it, it, it's foolish. This is your world. You've got to get into it. Might as well live in it. No, not really. Not really. This is not my world. And you want to know why I haven't come off the stage yet? Why I haven't started really yelling and screaming yet? Because you brought visitors today. <laughs> and I really want them to hear what I have to say without watching me say it. See? I really don't belong to this world. Yes, I love this country. You've heard me say this many times. I am an American citizen. Love it. Patriot. Wish I was a Navy SEAL. (laughs) Or something. But this is my second citizenship. My primary residence. My primary citizenship is in a place... Not on this earth. It's somewhere beyond the clouds. It's in that place where Jesus is right now. And that's where I'm headed. I'm not the only one to say that. You ought to see how Paul said it in Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. Watch this. For our citizenship is in heaven. From which we also what? I'm sorry. Eagerly, eagerly, eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. That simply means with all the power God has, He's going to use it on you one of these days to change what you are now into what He is forever. Where's your citizenship? Well, mine's in heaven. My, my, pass, my number one passport 
is in glory. I'm looking forward to it. Working on it. Making plans. Packing, even though there's nothing to take. (laughs) But I'm getting ready. It's not like sitting in the doctor's office twiddling your thumbs or reading a golf magazine over and over again. No, I'm busy. Now, and unlike the doctor's office, I don't know that he'll come by 5 o'clock today. And and like the stoplight, I don't know that it'll be a minute and a half or nine months. But I do know this. Jesus said, when you least expect it and when you're not looking, the Son of Man is going to come back in the clouds with power and great glory. He says, don't you ever let your guard down. Don't ever get comfortable. Don't ever say, well, it won't be today. Don't even ever say the signs aren't there. Because Jesus didn't give signs for the rapture. He just said, get ready. Put on your armor. Strap up your boots. Pick up the Word of God. Walk in the Spirit. Do the right thing. Look up. Lift up your heads. Your redemption draws nigh. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So, so what is this? How much? What is this we're doing? We're waiting on His Son from heaven. Heaven's a real place. Heaven's not a myth, not a fairy tale, not something you make up. Everybody doesn't go to heaven. All people don't go to heaven. Just those who put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ right now go to heaven. (laughs) Heaven has only one door. It's Jesus. Has only one gate. It's Jesus. Only one road. It's narrow. I don't care what Oprah told you about how many ways there are. I don't care what any Madonna or anybody else tells you. There is only one road. It's narrow. One door, it's Jesus. And one day, He's going to call us home and we'll walk through it. Praise God. It has dimensions. The city of God has dimensions. Now, a real place has dimensions. It's measured. It has partitions. There are structures in it. It's a real place. Heaven. But even the place is not heaven unless Jesus is there. Heaven is wherever Jesus is. So when Jesus comes back in the clouds, he's not just leaving heaven. He's he's coming to take us to himself, which is heaven. Now, I don't know what you know about heaven. I'm not sure that the Bible is exhaustive in its explanation of heaven. Here's what I know about it. Now, you know my preaching is really simple. I know that in heaven there is no sickness. Now, you can sit there all day and say, hey, hallelujah, praise God, I know. No, you don't know. Because there's never been a day since you've been alive... That there hasn't been something wrong in your body. Of course, I got some fellas saying, not me. I've never been to the doctor in my life, never took a pill, never took an aspirin. Healthy as a horse. Yeah, but your teeth are rotting. (laughs) And your eyes are dimming. Am I telling the truth? I'm not trying to be funny. And your back is a little more curved than it used to be. And your balance is not quite what it used to be. Don't look at me like that. And you got a little more stuff. (laughs) And all of that is a result of sin. But when I get to heaven, there will be no pain. No sickness. There will be no weakness. I will have no limitations whatsoever. I'm preaching too much. Sandra and I try to walk a lot, stay slim, slim, <laughs> and slim. So I made up a word. And since I have a little a- a- asthma problem, I really struggle to keep up with her sometimes. And the other day it was kind of humid like it is in here now. And we were climbing a hill and I was struggling, man, I'm telling you. She said, you want to stop? 
I said, stop. <laughs> this is the way I am. She said, we can go back home right now. I said, it will never happen. <laughs> Honestly, I do that self, to myself when I'm alone. I would rather die with a heart attack right here, gasping for air, as to say, I'm going home. Or have her walk me home. Come on, honey. Come on, I help you. That ain't going to happen. That is not going to happen. That is not going to happen. If I fall out, I ain't going back till I have finished. Whoa, I started something here. Till I have finished what I said I was going to do. It might be two miles. It might be four miles. But the preacher is going all the way. If I start out to do four, it'll be four. But when I get to heaven, I won't have to worry about breathing and weaknesses and being tired. That does not exist where I'm headed. There is no death up there. That means that the decay has been lifted. The curse is gone. The corruption is over. And what you are, you will be for eternity. Oh, hallelujah. There will be no sorrow up there. There's never been one day in your life when you haven't had some degree of sorrow. Am I telling the truth? And you know we've heard it all our lives. The first thing you do when you come into the world is cry. Isn't that the truth? I don't know why we did it. We were comfortable in there. But all of a sudden we're pushed out. And we're made to breathe and live on our own. And maybe that's cause to be sad. I don't know. But the first thing you do is get whacked. And then you start crying. And then you cried the rest of your life about something. Then it's so you can get some more milk. Later it's because you got to go to school. After a while because your boyfriend broke up with you. Later it's when your car broke down beside the road. After that you got in debt and you can't pay your bills. And then you got sick and then somebody died and the dog got run over. It's never been a day in your life. But I'm telling you, there's coming a glad day, a reunion day, a wonderful day when there will never be another tinge of sorrow in your life. I've been disappointed most days of my life in something. Maybe me. If not you, I've been disappointed in me. But there's been disappointment always. Sadness and temptation. Can you imagine what it would be like to live just one day without being tempted to do something that you know displeases God? But when you get there, since there is no flesh and certainly no devil, you will never experience temptation while eternity rolls. And then you want to know why I eagerly wait? Why I'm happy about my other citizenship? This world's full of nothing but the stuff I just preached about. So, want to know why I eagerly wait? (laughs) Drum roll! Come, Lord Jesus! Because all of these blessings come simply when you put faith in the Lord Jesus. What would you do to get there? And now, honestly, if, if you give me the benefit of the doubt or give God the benefit of the doubt and say, if all of that's true, what do I have to do to get it? What do I have to do to go there? I'm glad you came. The answer is believe. Simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask Him to save you from your sins and believe He is a Savior. And with that, you get the hope and the glory, the anticipation of one day seeing Him in heaven. Some say, well, I don't know if heaven's that good or not. I mean, how good can it be? Let me put it this way. Jesus said in Matthew 11... 
concerning John the Baptist. Of all the men that have been born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Wow. That's Elijah, Abraham, Moses, Daniel. Of all, even Paul was alive at that time. Of all the men born of women in the whole world, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Ready for this? But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. That's why I eagerly await. Greater than John the Baptist, the one who came in front of Jesus, the one who baptized Jesus. Are you, and he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. I guess to some people being the president of the United States is the height of accomplishment and power and earthly glory and renown. Think of it. And yet, to be the least one in the kingdom of heaven is a billion times, a billion times greater than being the president of the United States. And you know how we deify athletes in this country? Oh, he must have it made. He's worth 900 million. He has a pretty wife. He has several homes and cars and everybody wants him and he's filthy rich and everybody loves him. Let me tell you something. The person here that exercises faith in Jesus is a hundred trillion trillion times a billion gazillion <laughs> times greater in the kingdom of heaven than any or all athletes and all money and glory combined on this earth. And you want to know why I want to go to heaven? Folks, this is unbelievable stuff. And yet all you have to do to enjoy it is believe. Least in the kingdom of heaven, which tells you that you, you can't comprehend the glorious things that God has done for people who put faith in Jesus who will turn from idols to serve the living God and wait for His Son from heaven with eagerness and anticipation. It's yours for the asking. What would you do to go there? You don't have to do anything. It's a gift. You didn't hear that. It's a gift. Now thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. And here's the thing, because, see, I want to see souls saved. When one comes to Jesus, let me stop. Is there anybody in here who has never done anything wrong? Only one thing will send you to hell. And that one thing is not to believe on Jesus. See? So you take that plus white lies and finagling the money and playing with the numbers and all the stuff that people do down through the years. You know it. God knows it. And the older you get, the more it seems to accrue. And you see all of that. When you get to be an older man and you think about the stupid things you did as a young man, when you were full of uh, yourself it just accrues and there are times when you sit in your chair and you think man I've done some stupid things in my life <clears throat> and then somebody stands up and tells you you don't have much time left you know we have about 70 years give or take a few and then you have a preacher stand up and say there's a better place to go you don't have to die without Christ you don't have to pay for your own sins in hell all you have to do is believe on Jesus and it'll be gone. And you say, what? Yeah. When you believe on Jesus Christ, God erases every wrong thing you ever 
Is this microphone on? Wait. I said, when you believe on Jesus, He erases every wrong thing you ever did in your life and you get to start all over again. And on top of that, you get to go to heaven when He comes back in the clouds of glory. Stand up with me. And somebody who's happy about it ought to raise your hands and praise Him for it today. Praise God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Sometimes I still feel like a rascal and a scoundrel and a a rat. But I thank you, Lord, that your grace covers even that. You think more of me than I think of myself. Just because your son Jesus has come into my life. I'll make it quick. If there's anybody here today that wants to go to heaven. All you have to do is exercise faith in Jesus. I'm giving you a chance to walk to the altar. You don't need a friend. You don't need permission. Just come on down here. And in so doing, say, I want to go to heaven. I want Jesus to erase the sins in my life. I want to be what God wants me to be. All you have to do is walk down. We'll pray with you. It's the simplest thing you've ever done. You'll be ready for heaven. We'll sing a time or two till you make up your mind. Here it is. Glorious At any time during this day, while you're eating lunch, driving in the car, sitting in the den, if at any time you ever say to Jesus, will you forgive me of my sin? He will do it. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved bless you I'll see you tonight I'll be preaching out of the Bible (laughs) let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Lord my strength and my redeemer amen God bless you see you tonight unless Jesus comes for us